Um, so a lot of this in chapter 10 is actually review. Um, some of it's stuff that we've already talked about before. So it's talking about how you um, can identify microorganisms, the different tests that you can use, and then how a little bit again about how you put them into different categories. So like why are bacteria different than fungus and different than protozoa and that kind of thing. So we'll talk about, again about the three domains and talk about their differences. And then those three domains are also broken down into five kingdoms, which is something that we've talked about before. Um, talk about the metabolic categories that they fall into because you can actually use metabolism as a way to identify them in the lab by what, um, if you give them certain food sources, like what can they metabolize. Um, and then sources of carbon and energy used by living things. Taxonomy is really what this chapter is. Taxonomy is the science of putting things into groups and it's something that is important for science just to keep track of all the different things that exist. Um, and then be able to list the taxonomic hier hierarchy, hierarchy um, which is the, how the groups go from more broad to more specific. So the broadest groups are called domains and the most specific groups are called species. So as you get down through those groups, the things become more similar um, to each other. Um, scientific name, which is something we've talked about before, where you have to capitalize the genus and lowercase species, and then they're in italics. Um, define what a species is. Talk a little bit about viruses and why they're not part of the domains, which is also something we've talked about before. Um, talk about tests that do classification versus identification. Talk about the accuracy of diagnostic tests, which is often measured by the specificity and the sensitivity. And then describe the different types of tests that are used to identify um, bacteria. All right, so this is something that we have discussed before, that all living things can go into three big categories that are called domains. So um, all living things come from a common ancestor, and we don't know exactly what that common ancestor is, but every time we make discoveries about fossils or other cells that we can extract genetic material from, then this tree becomes more clear. And this is still a simplified version of a, of a tree. There's way more branches on it than this. But two of the domains are um, prokaryotic. So which two domains were prokaryotic? <coughs> Bacteria and archaea. So the difference between bacteria and archaea comes in the cell wall. Bacteria have peptidoglycan and archaea do not. And then one of them lives in extreme conditions. Does anyone remember which ones are extreme? The archaea. And then um, which one causes illness potentially? Bacteria. So those are basically the main differences between those two. Um, and then all the eukaryotic organisms are in eukarya. So that's the third domain. And so as we mentioned before, most life is microbial. Like there's only a few uh, kingdoms where it's visible things mostly, like, um, but most life on the tree of life is microbial. So again, just a reminder, the way you interpret the tree, like how it's laid out, is that like things that are sharing, a, branching off from each other have some kind of common ancestor. And so as you go out vertically, that's kind of, Time, I guess. So like these things are going to be more closely related to each other because it's been sooner that they had a common ancestor with each other than if you were to try to relate this one to like this one, it's been further back in time that they had a common ancestor. And so the more time that's passed, the more changes that have probably occurred. And then that means that those things aren't as similar to each other. So the, the tree is primarily built off of genetic information. So they've gotten DNA and RNA sequencing that tells them how related these things are to each other. Okay, so within the domains, there's um, typically five kingdoms. The system changes, like it's changed a lot since I was in school. And so I'm not sure what taxonomists like always use. Some of them probably have a preference as to what groupings they use, but these are the ones that I went with which is that there's five kingdoms. And so the one that's called Monera is where archaea and the true bacteria, which is what eubacteria means, that's where they are. So two of the domains represent one kingdom, is what I'm saying. Like, uh, but they are different in their cell wall and where they're found. And then all of the other kingdoms are in the eukaryotic domain. So that would be fungi, plants, 
animals, and protistans or protists or protozoans. So we talked a little bit about these um, and how they're different from each other. Protists are unicellular, nutritionally diverse. They're, they typically have an animal-like nutrition, so they eat their food. And they're often found in a watery environment, but some of them can photosynthesize like plants, and that would be like algae. So protists <coughs> are kind of weird. Like they're the ones that they're like, they're sort of like animals, but they're sort of like plants, but they're kind of like neither. So like, we'll just put them together. They're in a group together. Um, then you have fungi, which are your yeast, mold, and mushroom. So yeast are unicellular, mold is multicellular. And they absorb their food, so they don't do photosynthesis, but they actually just kind of break it down and then absorb the food into their body, which is a little bit different than what animals do, um, because animals ingest and then digest their food, and then they eliminate waste, where it's like fungus are kind of digesting it outside of their body and then taking it in to their body. Um, and then plants, we don't spend a lot of time talking about, because this is a clinical microclass, but there is a whole world of microbiology with plants. Plants have microbes that live with them, that can make them sick, but also that can help them take up nutrients through their root system. So there is a really close relationship between fungus and plants because fungus can help plants with their root system take up uh, food more effectively. Um, but plants are of note because they're photosynthesizers. And so really plants are probably what part of what contributed to life on Earth as we know it because they give off oxygen. And that's why they're so important, is that they clean up CO2 and use it for an energy source, a carbon source, and then they give off oxygen, which is what we need to survive. Um, animals are what we are. So animals um, and like the parasitic worms, we are multicellular by definition. So animals are typically things that you can see with your naked eye. Um, and we are sexually reproducing versus a lot of the other um, kingdoms are asexually reproducing, but by definition, an animal is um, sexually reproducing. Okay, um, so I mentioned the uh, energy and carbon sources that all living things can be put into. So this is another way to group living things together. You're grouping them together based off of their metabolic preferences. So you're grouping them together based off of their energy source that they use for metabolism and you're grouping them together based off of their carbon source. So remember we said all living things need carbon. And so there's two main sources of carbon. You can either get carbon from CO2 or you can get it from organic compounds. So those would be things like carbohydrates, for example. And then as far as the energy that you use during metabolism, it can either be chemical energy or it can be light energy. So those are the, the two dichotomies, is what is your carbon source and what is your energy source? So all organisms <coughs> need an energy source, right? Because we said that to be alive, you need energy. So there's two ways that you get energy, either chemical or light. Okay, and it's typically not both, it's one or the other. And that's why this is called the dichotomous key. This is something that you guys will use in lab. The outcome at every question is that it the answer has to be one or the other. It can't be both. So let's say that you use light energy. That would mean that you're somewhere over here as an organism. So are humans on this side? No, we don't use light energy directly. We utilize the benefits of light, but we don't use light for our metabolism. So then the ones that use light are called phototroph. The troph means nourishment or eating, sort of. And then photo means light. So those are the light eaters, like they use light to do their thing. And then what's their carbon source? Everything needs carbon, and it's either organic or CO2. So if you can use CO2, then you're called an autotroph, because that means that you can actually synthesize your own food. And if you use chemical uh, organic compounds, then you're called a heterotroph, because that means you need to eat other food. So as humans, which one are we? We're heterotrophs, right? Like we need to eat other food. We can't make our own food. Now we can store food, but it has to come from we've taken it in. Like I can't make a glycogen storage molecule until I take in some glucose, right? Like I'm not able to just make my own sugars per se. It has to come from my diet. 
All right, so you use light energy, your carbon source is one or the other, and that's what makes you a photoheterotroph or a photoautotroph. Then they ask another question like, do you use water to reduce the carbon dioxide? And if you say yes, then you're a photosynthetic organism. And this is what plants are. Okay, plants and algae and certain bacteria are photoautotrophs. So they make their own food and they use CO2 as their carbon source and they use light energy. Now, if you don't do that reaction, then you're called an anoxygenic photosynthetic organism. And that means that you don't give off oxygen as part of your photosynthesis. And I, don't, I didn't really know a lot about these kind of critters, but it's like bacteria. So like green and purple bacteria that I guess live in the water or in the soil. They do photosynthesis, but they don't give off oxygen like trees do. So that's the difference between a plant versus these weird bacteria, is that plants give off oxygen and those weird bacteria do not. Now, if you were using light energy, but chemical, um, like you have to eat your food, like you have to eat your carbon source, that's other weird bacteria. Okay, so they call them purple sulfur, non-sulfur bacteria, and green non-sulfur bacteria. Again, those are things that typically are found in the soil and the water. So they use light energy, but they can't make their own food. They have to eat food, so that's kind of weird. And nothing really fits into that category except these bacteria. So then if you go to the other side, you use chemical energy, you're not using light energy. So what falls into those categories? Again, you go to carbon source. So if they use chemical energy, they call chemotrophs. Chemotroph means chemical nourishment. So they're eating chemicals. And then their carbon source is either organic or CO2. So if it's CO2, then you call them chemoautotrophs. Those are things that use chemical energy, so they eat their food, but they can actually um, make it themselves. So they take in chemical energy to make their own food. And really, it's weird bacteria. So a lot of these bacteria, the hydrogen, sulfur, iron, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, oxidizing bacteria, are found in the environment. And they're important as part of the like uh, environmental recyclers like because they're able to break down these waste products. Now, if you're uh, taking organic compounds and you can't make your own food, you have to ingest it, those are called chemoheterotrophs. And then the next thing they ask is, what is, is oxygen their final electron acceptor? And if you say yes, that's where animals are. Okay, animals, most fungi, protozoa, and a lot of the bacteria. Now, if they are a chemoheterotroph, but they're not using oxygen, then they ask, well, are you using an organic compound or are you using an inorganic compound? And then that will tell the difference between, again, different bacteria that you have. So notice that bacteria are in all the groups. Okay, bacteria can be chemoheterotroph, chemoautotroph, photoautotroph, chemoautotroph. Like they fall across the board. So very diverse. Um, so I think to understand this, it helps to know an example of something that is each of those things. So to recap this, it's not like you memorize this chart. I mean, if you, if you just break down the words, you can kind of figure it out. But everything has an energy source. It's either light or chemical. And then everything has to have a carbon source. It's either organic or it's CO2. And then you can ask subsequent questions to put them into different categories. If you're called an autotroph, it means that you can synthesize your own food stuff. If you're a heterotroph, then it means you have to ingest your food from somewhere. You have to get your food from an outside source. Okay, any questions on that? That's a big reason why we have kingdoms um, is because of, of this, like how they do their metabolism. All right, so taxonomy is just putting things in a group. Taxa means groups. So you're putting them in a group based off of their relationship to each other. And this little tree up here is called a phylogeny, where organisms are grouped together based off of common properties, which in this case is their genetic makeup. That's how you put them together. And we assume that they evolved from a common ancestor, and then every species has something in common with the common ancestor. So a clade is just a genetically related group, so that would be a branching on a tree. So like each of these little groups here at the end are called clades. 
And that comes from, the info comes from the fossil record. So as we get fossils and we can analyze the genetic material, we add more branches to the tree. So this is showing um, KPC strains that were isolated from an intensive care unit. So hopefully you're recognizing that the reason it's kind of a circle is because the bacterial chromosome is kind of circular, but this is actually showing a different map. Um, this is showing a tree with a common ancestor of KPC, and then they identified all these different subtypes. So basically there's like um, this one area of the genome where they saw that there were some differences in between them, and then that's what led them to different strains. And so they saw that there were quite a few different um, isolates that um, were seen in this intensive care unit. And the ones that they um, basically highlighted in blue are sporadic ones that popped up. So they were like random mutants that came up in the population. Um, and then the green, the red, and the violet are the ones that um, are most closely related to each other. And that's where a lot of the other ones came from. So they all came from the same group uh, as each other. And so the reason why you might do this information is because then they could couple that with their resistance profile so that if you had a certain strain, they would know which drug might work. So for KPC, they're kind of resistant to all the drugs. And there's this drug that's called colistin. Colistin is like a drug of total last resort. Like it's super toxic and you really wouldn't want to use it, but it's the only thing that will like kill KPC sometimes. And so they noticed that certain strains were resistant to KPC and those are the ones that are kind of overlaid with red. Um, and then some of them are susceptible to KPC. And then they probably would see of course a difference in mortality and morbidity because if it's an untreatable thing, then really it's just up to whatever powers that you survive, right? And then if it's a treatable one, that means it's susceptible to the colistin, and then those strains are gonna be different genetically than the ones that aren't, that are resistant, okay? So they're, they're able to map out which strains are resistant and which strains came from where, like which ones are more closely related to each other um, in this uh, ICU setting. All right, um, if you have a eukaryotic species, then these are organisms that can breed typically among themselves if you're talking about animals. Um, prokaryotic species, because they're asexually reproducing, they're just a population of cells that have similar characteristics. Um, sometimes bacteria in the same species, you pretty much can't distinguish them from each other. They're pretty much genetically identical but there can be mutations that cause them to be strains of each other. So strains are species that are the same, but just slightly different. Um, and sometimes they'll have different like number designations, I guess. Um, a clone is when you have pure culture, so all the cells in that culture came from one original. And that's what we hope when you have a colony on a plate, that the, it is pure culture. Um, and then a strain is where they're the same but not identical in all ways. And so that's what that mapping was showing on the previous diagram. Those were all Klebsiella strains. <coughs> they were all Klebsiella pneumoniae and they were all carbapenemase producing, but they weren't all exactly the same. And that's why the map was like a little bit different and had different coatings on it. So as far as how you, um, like the taxonomic hierarchy is, um, shown here, and maybe if you've taken biology before or you had to know it in high school. And so it's domain, kingdom, final class, order, family, genus, species. And so there's different lame ways, like mnemonic devices you can know to remember the order. Like I've heard deer, king, Philip comes over for grape soup or grape soda or whatever you want, like, right? Like a mnemonic device is where you make up a little like saying that helps you know the order. But as the groups go down, they get more specific. So for example, if we use, I use the dog as my example because I find that the easiest to understand. So a dog is a eukaryotic organism and it's in the kingdom called Animalia, which is all the animals. So all the animals is a huge group, right? Like it's literally all the animals, like a dolphin, an ant, a person, a dog, a cat, whatever. 
So then when you get to the phylum, you get more specific. You have this group called chordata. Chordata are the chordates, and chordates are things that have a spinal cord. So those are things that have a, uh, a spinal cord and that kind of nervous sensation. Then when you go to the class, you go to uh, mammalia, and those are mammals, and mammals are things that give birth to live young and produce milk. And then you get down to carnivora, and carnivora are things that eat meat. And the reason that they know that they're meat eaters is because of the way their teeth are shaped, like they have teeth that are made more for tearing, and maybe they have sharper claws to deal with meat. And then you get down to the family, which is canidae, and canidae is like canine, right? It's things that are dog-like. Um, so that could be stuff like wolves or coyotes, but wolves and coyotes are not in the same genus as those things, and they might not actually be in the same family either. Canidae are all the things that are domestic dog-like, and so then you have a genus that's called Canis, and then Familiaris, that's the general domestic dog. Okay, and then we know that there's different like breeds of dogs, right? They're not different species, I guess, but they're different like variants, because they're all dogs. They're all Canis familiaris, I guess, but they're slightly different, like you have pugs and chihuahuas and labs and shepherds and stuff. So to me, that's kind of similar to like a bacterial strain, is that like they're pretty much the same, like a dog is a dog, but like they're different. They're not exactly the same. And the same thing happens with um, bacteria. So if you look at the um, bacteria, the same kind of schematic, a lot of times they don't assign a kingdom to bacteria because they think that they're pretty much all the same. And then you have a phylum that's called proteobacterium. Uh, proteobacterium are most, like where pretty much all the gram negatives are, like a lot of the gram negatives are in that group that cause the disease in humans. And then gamma proteobacteria is a group within proteobacteria where a lot of human pathogens are, especially ones that are found in the gut of animals. And then that plays into the order, which is called enterobacterialis, which entero means intestine. So these are gram-negative bacteria that are found in the intestines. And then uh, E. coli, which is Escherichia coli, I can't remember what Escherichia means, but coli means colon. And that's where E. coli is typically found is in the large intestine of warm-blooded animals. So the reason you have these designations is to know specifically what you're talking about. That when I say dog, you all know what I mean. Like I mean like the domestic, I'm talking about the domestic dog, that's our buddy, um, and they're carnivores, they're meat eaters, so these people are trying to make their dogs vegan or basically killing their dogs. And uh, they have babies, like we know that dogs have puppies and when they produce milk, and so it gives you, and we know that they have a vertebral column, they have like a spinal cord, um, which actually I think I misspoke. The chordates are the vertebrates, <coughs> so those are the ones that have a spinal column. You also have animals that are invertebrates, like um, I guess like snakes or whatever, that don't have a rigid spinal column. Okay. All right, so that's the taxonomic hierarchy. It's domain, kingdom, phylum, uh, class, order, family, genus, species. And as you go down the group, the groups get more specific. And like said another way, like, um, like the class mammalia has groups of carnivores that are related to each other, but then they kind of branch off once you get down further onto that hierarchy. All right, so um, there's, I guess, a designation between classification and identification, which honestly I don't find this that important. The way I think of it is that normally you want to identify something, right? Like if you're trying to figure out what disease someone has, you don't want to say like it's some kind of bacteria like, or it's some kind of virus. Like you kind of want to know what it is so that you can initiate proper treatment. Um, and so basically some tests can do both of these things at the same time. But they're just, I guess they're, the difference is in like how broad the definition is. So classification would say this is gram-negative bacteria. Identification would say this is E. coli specifically. Okay, so it's just a level of specificity that's different. So this is showing just some of the different tests and what they're able to do, and it kind of depends on the different test type. 
So for example, <laughs> the differential staining can both identify and classify because you can say that it's gram negative, but depending on what sample you, can, you got it from, you can also say like, oh, it's E. coli. Um, but some of the tests are better for classifying, meaning they give you a broad indication of what it is. So a lot of the ones, like if you're gonna use like uh, ribosomal RNA, for example, the reason that that's considered classification is because things that are, anything that's bacteria is gonna have similar ribosomal RNA. Like that's very conserved trait among organisms. Anything that's eukaryotic is gonna have a very similar ribosomal RNA. So for that reason, you can't tell exactly what something is by looking at that trait. And so that's why some of the tests are better for classifying versus identifying. But just know that for realistic purposes, like if you're working as a clinician or in a lab, you want to identify usually. Like you wanna know exactly what it is. All right, then there's um, the viruses, which um, basically are not alive as far as we know. And we've kind of talked about this before, um, that they're not alive, and it's because they don't do things that living things do. So remember <coughs> viruses, um, what did we say that they're kind of lacking? Like what is it that they don't do? What's the fundamental thing about a virus that makes it not alive? Like number one. What's it does need a host, and that's kind of important because most living things can kind of live on their own. But they're not made out of cells. Like, that's probably the biggest thing, right? Like, they're literally not made out of cells. Like, and we said all living things are made out of cells. They're particles. Like, they're very strange. They're protein particles that use the host to replicate. Um, so viruses are kind of interesting because they... We don't think they're alive, so they don't have a domain, but we still try to like classify them. And I probably, sh I should have given you an example of this, because I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. So for example, like there's a group of viruses that are called uh, arboviruses. And that's like a, a family, I guess, of viruses that are arthropod born. So R is for arthropod. And then Bo is a shortened of born. So these are things that are spread by insects, like bites. So I guess that big group includes stuff like, um, like Zika virus and West Nile virus. And I think, um, Yellow fever maybe is in that group too. So they group the viruses not based off of like metabolism, but like wh how they're transmitted or what kind of host they infect. So like you've probably heard of <coughs> um, herpes before. So there's this group of virus that are called human herpes viruses. And they affect humans, right? Like that's why and they're all causing herpes like lesions. Like, which are blisters. So the viral taxonomy is a little bit different is all I'm saying. Like it's not necessarily based on chemotroph, autotroph, because they're not alive. So you can't really group them together that way. They group them together based off of their similar characteristics. So they look at their shape. Like for example, coronaviruses are called that because they have a crown around them. Corona means crown. They've got these like little spike things that look like a crown, like all around them. But coronaviruses, there's different strains of them, right? So like if we look at coronavirus as our example, you have the coronaviruses and corona means crown, that has to do with the way they look. And then you've heard that there's, all right up here, there's different ones, like there's the SARS uh, coronavirus one, that was what happened back in like 2008 when SARS was a thing. And SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus, number one. And now we have SARS-CoV-2, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus number two, which is what causes the disease known as COVID-19. It's a different strain. And then there's also just like other coronaviruses that just cause common cold, like all the time. Um, there was another one that came out a little while ago that was called MERS. It was Middle Eastern 
respiratory syndrome coronavirus. Okay, it came from the Middle East, and luckily it was pretty virulent, but it didn't get super widespread. So that's what I mean by the classification, is that like things can be grouped in a larger grouping, coronaviruses, typically are, have a certain shape, and they affect the lower respiratory and upper respiratory system, but it depends on which strain, how virulent they're gonna be. Okay, so like there's a bunch of strains of coronavirus, they're not all scary, but some of them are. Um, the reason we're having such issue with um, SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID, is because it's new. Um, and so there's probably not a lot of immunity to it yet. We don't have herd immunity yet for it. Okay, um, so viruses aren't alive as far as we know. They require a host to survive. They don't have metabolism. They're not made out of cells. They can't really live on their own. Like they don't require energy to have to live off of the host. And so we have to group them together kind of a little bit differently. Like we group them based off of their shape or what kind of host they infect or what kind of disease they cause. Okay. All right, so um, viruses again are just like these little particle things and we group them based off of their host. So for example, I said you have human herpes viruses. Um, their particle morphology, so their shape of their capsid, which is the protein coat, or if they have an envelope. And then their genome type is another way to identify them. And their genetic material can be single-stranded or double-stranded, and it can be circular or linear. So that's another reason why they're like kind of strange, is that they don't do typical like, um, like our molecular dogma that we're used to. So um, a lot of times the way when I talk about viruses for you guys, I present it as DNA versus RNA viruses because the way they replicate is a little bit different. And then you can also look at the disease symptoms, antigenicity. So like, for example, um, with disease symptoms, that's kind of how they put the coronaviruses together, right? Because they say it's severe acute respiratory syndrome. So they're, they're putting those viruses, they're designating them by their symptomology. Um, and then antigenicity is the antigens that are on the surface of the, of the virus. And that's where you can get different um, typing, so like you guys have heard of flu being called H1N1 and those kind of designations. So like with influenza um, type A, those are the seasonal flus that float around and they have different antigens that come up all the time. So H1N1 is the swine flu. Uh, but then there's a bunch of other ones like uh, H2N3, uh, I think there's like an H7N9, which maybe is bird flu, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they, they, they will say in parentheses, like this is swine flu, it originated from some weird mutation that happened in swine and then it got to humans. Or this is bird flu, it originated in birds, but then it mutated so that it could go into humans. And then when we have scary outbreaks is when it becomes transmissible human to human. So probably initially with coronavirus, my guess would be that it wasn't initially transmissible human to human, maybe. Like, I don't know if there's an identified animal reservoir for coronavirus. I don't know if anyone's heard anything. I've heard bats, which bats are good carriers for just a lot of different viruses. And so having some proximity to a bat, maybe. I know for Ebola, that's kind of what they've identified as the reservoir, which is a bat. And the reservoir is something that can provide adequate conditions so that it can go into another host. Um, and so if you have a reservoir and a human lives near the reservoir, then it, it is itself a risk factor. But the pandemics happen when it becomes transmissible human to human, because you're not gonna have widespread transmission from bat to human, but because of the way humans live so close together, you will have it from human to human. So these are other ways that you, know, you can identify viruses by the proteins that they have, on their surface, the antigens, the host range, like is this a virus that can infect multiple hosts? Or is it only in one type of host? There's all different ways that viruses end up getting classified. And it's just a little bit, it's not as straightforward as with the eukaryotic system, which is where it's purely based on like cell type, metabolism, reproduction. These don't do that, so they're just gonna put them in different groups. All right, so then you might think, uh, where do viruses come from? Like, if they're not alive, like, why are they here? And these are just a couple of hypotheses uh, about that. 
So one is that they have always been independent. So they've always been freely replicating genetic material. Um, similar to plasmids, which are the little circular pieces of DNA that you can transfer from bacteria, um, they can transfer to each other. Um, they could be degenerative cells that have lost the ability to survive. So basically, like, they used to be a cell, but then they were like, eh, I don't, this is too much work. Like, I'm going to live in the host and let them do some of the work for me. And then over time, I'm going to start to break down because I don't need to work as hard because I have the host to do that for me. Which that kind of makes sense to me, right? <laughs> we probably have people like that in our lives. They're like, I'm just not going to try anymore because you'll do everything. Okay? And then co-evolution. So there's some evidence that as long as there's been humans, there's been viruses. Like that we've just had a relationship with these little things. I think when they've looked at certain like mummies or fossils or whatever, they've seen evidence of viral genes like present. Like so things like smallpox were like ancient diseases. Like smallpox had been around forever, like seemingly as long as humans have been around. Yes. The notes like repeat? Like, um, do they? Is there yeah. a repeat? Like, it's like Goes from the organ viruses. Oh, weird. So there's like an extra. Yeah, all the way to like the organ viruses again. Oh, snap. So yeah. Okay, but is it all in there, hopefully? Yeah, it okay, is, it's just duplicate. It on That's so weird. 14. Sorry. Let's all get resituated. <coughs> okay, so I guess the second origin of viruses. <laughs> and then skip ahead to the third one. I don't know. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so we're on the, in the spot maybe. So now we need to be here. Sorry if that was confusing. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> Sometimes people just stare at me weird and then I don't know why. I get all <laughs> like what, what's going on? All right, so the old school <coughs> method of identifying bacteria is kind of what we do in lab. <laughs> like because you know we don't have a ton of resources and this is an intro lab. Um, where we like can just figure out what it is by a set of properties that it has. And so that's called a determinative scheme, like determinative bacteriology. So there's actually like a book, which I've never used it, um, but there's a book that has a bunch of these schemes, and those schemes are the idea behind the dichotomous key. So the dichotomous key is like, and I think it's fun if you could make, you could make one yourself. So for example, you're like, likes coffee, Yes or no? And then you like ask some other silly question, right? Like you can make one up like, is always tired? Yes, should like coffee, right? Like, like you could go back to it. So it's the same idea, but for bacteria. So you can identify them based off of their shape, coupled with um, their behaviors. So you, you have tests in the lab that can identify these behaviors. You have tests that can see what their metabolism is. You have tests that can show you what they look like under the microscope. And then that information all together can determine what it is. And that's why they call it a determinative scheme. Okay. So morphology does not tell you genetic relatedness because it's very generic. Because if you remember, there's only like three shapes typically that bacteria take, which are coxy, bacilli, and spiral. And then there's some other variations. But if I look at a cell, if I could just look at a cell without staining it, and it was a rod, I don't know what it is. Like there's like thousands of rods. And then if I saw two different rods, I wouldn't know just from that information that they were related to each other or not. Because like we all look similar as humans, and some of us might even have a twin out there. We have someone that looks like us. They call it the doppelganger. But that doesn't mean we're related to each other. Like, just because we look the same. Um, and then two people can be related to each other and not look the same at all. Like, you, you know, you had a sibling or a cousin that you're like, where did this person come from? They don't look like any of us, okay? So you can't always tell things just by morphology. You have to combine it with, in the case of bacteria, a differential stain. So you're not just coloring it randomly or just coloring the whole thing, you're coloring something specific about it that is used for identification. 
And so our, our differential stain that's important for um, bacteria is the gram stain. Okay, so the gram stain is what we use as a differential stain. And then sometimes you can use what's called the acid fast stain, and that's for like tuberculosis, okay, um, and identifying that. All right, biochemical tests are used to tell you about their metabolism. So basically, you give them in the culture media something to like eat from, and then you see if they can use it, okay? Um, so if they can use it, then sometimes the media is designed to turn certain colors um, because they're able to use it a certain way. It makes a pH change, and then it'll show you something about maybe where they live even. Um, because they can only really live places if they can use the food that's in that place. Okay, so you can use their biochemistry, which is their metabolism, by using selective and differential media. So this is an example of selective and differential media that could be used to identify an organism. So if you remember in lab, we said that um, TSA was non-selective. So what does that mean if it's non-selective? What will grow on TSA? Pretty much anything, okay? So anything that's not super picky will grow on TSA. And that doesn't really help you if you're trying to identify, right? Because it could literally be anything on the plate. So that's where the selective and differential media comes in. So there's this selective and differential media that's called XLD. Um, XLD stands for um, like xylose lysine deoxycholate auger, and it has stuff in it that will eliminate things that are not gram negative. So specifically, it's gram negative Enterobacteriaceae, which are gram negatives that live in the gut and that can cause certain food poisoning. And so this media is actually really good for telling you if you have Salmonella or Shigella. And Salmonella and Shigella are very similar to each other. But they're different enough that this media can actually physically detect that difference. So basically, um, the first selective process, I guess, is if they can ferment xylose, which is a weird sugar, then they will grow on this plate to start with. So anything that's gram positive from the gut cannot grow on this plate because it can't use the xylose. So which organism is a gram positive then? Which one is not growing? Enterococcus. Okay, Enterococcus is a gram positive so it won't grow on XLD because it doesn't use that sugar. And then there's an amino acid called lysine and if you decarboxylate the lysine, it releases a hydrogen sulfide that's black in color. And salmonella does that. So this is why it's differential. If you didn't have that lysine in it, then you wouldn't be able to tell salmonella from shigella because they would both make these like clear colonies. But by adding the lysine, you get that black byproduct, and that tells you for sure that it's salmonella because salmonella is pretty much the only thing that will do that to the lysine on this media. Now the um, deoxycholate is, an, is a detergent. That's the other thing that inhibits gram positives. So the selective mechanism for this is, is complicated, but it's the deoxycholate which is a detergent that will select for the gram negatives because it'll kill the gram positives. And then it's differential for xylose fermentation because things that ferment xylose will look a certain way. And then if it is able to decarboxylate lysine, which is an amino acid, that's the other differential component. And that, it's that part that's important for telling if it's salmonella because you'll get a black byproduct only if it's salmonella. So hopefully you can appreciate, because that's like way more information than TSA gives you. It's using the normal metabolism, the expected metabolism of these organisms to help you identify them. And then you might wonder, well, why would I want to know it's salmonella? Because that causes food poison. 
But Shigella also causes raging diarrhea. <laughs> like Shigella is just a different risk factor. So you're more likely to get salmonella from contaminated food, but you're more likely to get Shigella from a contaminated person, like a, a food handler or like it could shut down a daycare for a couple days, right? It's very contagious. Like it only takes a few Shigella bacteria to cause people to get sick. Okay, any questions on that? So differential is where you physically can differentiate. And then selective is where you select for the thing that you are interested in. And we're not interested in enterococcus, and that's why it didn't grow on this plate. So they have all kinds of cool media that works this way. All right, I mentioned the dichotomous key. This is what you guys will be using in lab um, as part of the midterm when you learn how to identify your unknown. So dichotomous, there's two choices at each. And it reminds me of like, I don't know, do people still read Cosmo? I remember reading a lot when I was younger and they always have those keys like, where should I work when I grow up? And it's like, I'm more artistic, I'm more conservative. And then you go down your little pathway, right? And to me, it's kind of like the same thing, like one of those fun personality quizzes, right? So it's like, which bacteria is this? So let's ask some questions. So the first thing you ask is, can they ferment lactose on this particular example? Lactose is a sugar, and not everything can ferment lactose. Fermentation, remember, is the process of breaking it down to get energy in the absence of oxygen. And so if you can, then they ask a question. And if you say no, then you ask another question. So let's say you say no, then you say, can they use citric acid as a carbon source? And if you say no, then it's Shigella. And if you say yes, then it's Salmonella. So they can't be both. They can't, that's part of how the key works. So you never want to like skip a line because then you're making something true that isn't true. Like you're, you're reading the wrong relationship. So if you work your way backwards and someone asks you to describe enterobacter, You'd be like, oh, it produces this thing, acetoin. I forgot what that is. It's just some kind of byproduct, I guess. And also, it uses citric acid, and also it's a lactose fermenter. So it's a set of conditions that have to be met for it to be enterobacter. And if any of those conditions aren't true, it's not enterobacter, usually. Okay, because there's strain differences, and sometimes they could be funky. So that's how you guys will figure out your unknown, is that you'll be given a bacteria, you don't know what it is, and you do a series of tests, and then it's upon the interpretation of those tests that you just go to your key, and then you can figure out what it is. So it's actually like pretty easy. We do it like a very simple way. All right, other tests that can tell you what they are are these rapid identification tests. And the reason that these are nice is because they're fast. They don't necessarily require you to culture large amounts of organisms. They don't take a lot of skills they don't usually need additional instruments. And sometimes they can be even more accurate just because of the way that they um, work and how they're interpreted. So examples of this are the rapid strep test. Um, there's different versions of it. You guys do a rapid strep test in lab where you don't actually swab your own throat, but you use a positive and negative control. But basically the antigens that are on the surface of the strep bacteria will get trapped in the test. And then that will show up as your positive line. Then there's this other example of a thing called an enero tube. Basically, it's like this uh, like syringe-like thing that's filled with different kinds of auger. And you have your bacteria that you don't know what it is growing on a plate. And then you have an inoculating needle. And you touch the needle to the colony, and then you pull the plunger through. And it inoculates all of these tests. So instead of having like a, like a separate test tube for each one, it's all in this little stick, which is nice. And then each one's going to turn a different color after you incubate it. And then you would just look at whatever the test insert says that means. Like sometimes there's a computer database. You would enter, like, in order, this was positive, blah, 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 blah. And then it tells you what the organism <coughs> is. So it's a quick way to figure it out. All right, so as far as how accurate, uh, accurate your tests are, in order for a test to be, I guess, useful or meaningful, it needs to be valid. So it needs to actually test for the things that you want to test for. Um, it needs to have some kind of reproducibility so that if you did this test 100 times, you would expect a certain number of results that many times. Um, and so measures of the accuracy are often noted as specificity and sensitivity. So specificity 
is how good is the test at telling you that someone does not have a disease, which would be the true negatives. So said another way, if someone's test is negative, you're pretty sure they're negative. If that's good, like a high level, then you have high specificity. So by having high specificity, it means you have fewer false positives. Um, because they're not going to call someone positive because they're really good at detecting who's actually negative, I guess. And then the other side is the sensitivity. And this is how well the test will determine people with a disease. So, for example, if you think about the pregnancy test, and you know they show the commercials, the uterus is glowing like 10 days before you miss your period, like magic. And the tests are better and better at detecting minute amounts of HCG. So when they say that that test is 99% accurate or whatever, um, what they're saying is that it's got 99% sensitivity. Meaning that if that test is positive, you're pregnant. Like 99% of the time, you're pregnant. If you took that test 100 times, you'd be, it would say you were pregnant 99 times. Okay, so that, so when you're looking, and that's important, um, but they, it can't be 100%, and this is the part that's, oh, I always kind of stumble over explaining, because the more positives you collect, the more likely you might get some false positives, and so that's why they both can't be 100, I guess, and I'll, I'll try to think of a better way, to, a different way to explain that in a minute here. All right, so an example um, of specificity and sensitivity using like biomarkers. So biomarkers are like things that you can measure that tell you a person's like likelihood of having a disease. So like if you look at A1C, which is kind of like your average sugar that's been, what, I think it's like three months, the last three months or something like that. Um, how they decide if a person has diabetes usually isn't any one test, like they would have to do a couple different tests to figure it out. But there is a range of values that are considered normal, and there's a range of values that are considered pre-diabetic, and then there's a range of values that if you're above that, you would be considered diabetic. So the pre-diabetes is what is a little bit of a gray area, because I think like a couple years ago, they actually decided to push it back a little bit to what they considered pre-diabetes. Like, I think they pushed it back to like, it was for a long time 5.7, and I think it might still be 5.7 or 5.6, but they considered like pushing it back to like 5.4 or 5.5, because they thought, well, lower A1C is better, right? So what happens if you push back the cutoff point? You're gonna say some people have diabetes that don't. So you're gonna get a false positive. So there's like this balance between finding the sweet spot where you minimize false positives and false negatives. And so you can see that if you do push the cutoff point back a little bit, you will identify more sick people, but you will falsely call some healthy people sick. And so that's why it's hard to find like exactly where that line is, especially for something like diabetes that's like super complicated. Does everyone understand that example, I guess? So then the other way that I think about it in my mind, specificity versus sensitivity. So let's say that I was, like I had a fishing net. <coughs> and let's say that my positive result that I'm trying to catch is a certain size of fish. Well, if I make my holes too small in my net, I'm gonna catch other crap that is not my fish, right? Like I'm gonna catch like a shoe or whatever, or a can. If I make my holes too big, some of my fish are gonna slip through. And then I won't catch that as a positive result. So when you increase your sensitivity, you automatically decrease your specificity and vice versa. And, it, and it's like, it's mathematical, like they're inverses of each other, which I don't go that far to show you that. They can't both be 100, but ideally they both be high, okay? Now, another thing that I would ask you guys to think about is, like, what, what do you think is worse? Do you think that it's worse to tell someone that they have a disease and they don't, or tell them they don't have a disease and they do? What do you feel like is a worse thing? So it would depend on the disease, right? Like, if you tell them they do and they don't, like it's something scary, like cancer or HIV, and then they 
you know, they have the psychological panic, and then like, what if it's cancerous and it makes you do some invasive procedure that wasn't necessary? So you could argue that that's bad too, right? But I would argue that the other one is just as bad, pretend, like, you know, uh, depending on what it is, right? So what's the problem that if you tell someone they don't have a disease, but they actually do? What's the problem with that? Yeah, you don't treat it, right? And if it's an infectious disease, can't they give it to someone else? So if you think about coronavirus, having false negatives is bad. Having false negatives is a worse error because if someone is falsely negative, then they may prematurely go off somewhere and give it to someone else. And that's why there's rules that like, if you're waiting for a test, you should not be going around. Like if you're waiting for a test, you should be like isolating yourself. But then if you had an exposure at all that was a true exposure, you still are supposed to stay away for 10 days regardless of your test result for that very reason. Because if you test too early, you will get likely, you have more likelihood of a false negative because the virus won't show up on the test I think until typically between like four and five days after exposure. And some people don't ever get symptoms anyway, so they wouldn't know. It's just kind of complicated, but hopefully um, that makes sense, okay, a little more sense. So I don't make you like calculate specificity or, or uh, sensitivity, but sometimes like as bonus question, like I'll, I'll like describe a test and then you tell me about the specificity and sensitivity based on what I said. Like, so if I said like 80% um, of people that test positive for this test are actually positive, then you would say the sensitivity is 80%. Does that make sense? Like, so it would just be more like application. All right, so that's the accuracy of a test. Um, now we're going back to another type of test, which is called serology. Um, serology is where you use antibodies to detect um, antigens, and you can also do it the other way. You can use antigens to detect antibodies. So antibodies are proteins that are made by the immune system, and they are made specifically for that particular thing, whatever it is, if it's bacteria. So like, um, you can identify an unknown bacterium by using a known antibody. So the antibody is literally like a lab product like a little bottle, and you add it to a sample that you're not sure what it is, and if the reaction occurs, then that is what it is, because those antibodies will only react to the thing that they were generated for. Okay, so let's say you had two different serotypes or strains. A lot of times people will misspoke, and they'll call them strands, but strands is not a correct term. It's strain or serovar or serotype. That's usually what they use. Um, and so... A serotype would represent a different antigen. So like if this was a bacterium, the surface of one looked like this, and the surface of the other looked like that. So the antibodies that bind to this one will not be the same antibodies that bind to this one. So let's say that serotype two, well, you knew that that one is more pathogenic. So if we use, for example, E. coli, um, E. coli, not all E. coli is created equal. The one that's most potentially harmful to people is 0157. That's the antigen that's on the LPS in the, in the outer membrane of it. And different versions of that can cause different inflammatory, like immune responses, different problems in the host. And so if you wanted to figure out, is this 0157 or not? You would add antibodies that will only bind to 0157 antigens. And this is what it's showing here is that Let's say that the orange antigen that has a little round thing, let's say that that was 0157. And then let's say all the other colors were different numbers, like 64, 32, 104. Like they represent different strains. Well, if your organism is covered in this antigen, then that antibody is going to bind to it, and that's how you'll know what antigen is there. And it's knowing what antigen is there that tells you what strain it is. Okay, does that make sense? So your body does this. I think people get confused because it's like, wait, antibodies like my body make? Yes. But they can generate them in an animal and then use them as a little lab thing. And then you can figure out which, um, <coughs> which organism you have, which strain you have. Because you'll see it as clumping when they bind together. Okay, so this is the clumping I'm talking about. This is agglutination. 
So let's say um, what, what we do in our lab is we, we determine if it's Staph aureus or not. So Staph aureus is potentially a pathogen. So we're interested to know, is this in our sample Staph aureus? So let's say we already think it's some kind of Staph. We've done a gram stain and it looks like Staph on the gram stain. And now we want to know, is it aureus or something else? So we have unknown antigens, right? We have a bacterium, but we're not exactly sure what it is. So then we add known antibodies because we have to have a process of elimination, right? So in the case of this, we are adding anti-Staph aureus antibodies. And they will only bind if Staph aureus is in the sample because aureus will have the unknown antigens that we're trying to find. And when they all bind together, they will clump, and that's a positive result. That's called agglutination. <coughs> and you will see it as clumpy. If it's not that antigen, then that binding is not going to occur, and you will not see clumping. So that's a way that you can identify what strain you have, is by doing serology-based tests. Serology means using like antibodies, essentially, to identify different, different things. All right, so that's agglutination which is a type of serological test. And you guys will do that in lab too. All right, then there's a bunch of molecular methods. And actually, chapter 9 was uh, more in-depth about molecular methods. Anytime you see something called a molecular method, you should think like DNA or RNA. It's basically like genetic, different kinds of genetic type testing. So these are just some examples. There's one that's called DNA fingerprinting. And it's kind of similar to um, what you get from ribotyping. But with fingerprinting, what they do is they take DNA from the sample, like from the organism, and they use these things called restriction enzymes, and they just chop it up. And because it chops at a certain spot, everyone's pattern is going to be different. So you get an actual pattern of DNA bands from chopping it up. And then that means it's a certain organism. And then if two fingerprints look similar, then that means those organisms might be closely related to each other. Another thing you can do is look at the DNA composition, which this is, I don't know how often this is actually done, but you look at the percentage of G and C that's in their DNA. So you actually sequence all their DNA. And you look at the G and C. And if the difference between two organisms is less than 10%, then they're not closely related. They are closely related to each other. So they can see what the relative composition of their DNA is to show if they're related. With humans, it would be like all almost exactly the same, except for a few differences that make us each unique. Okay, ribotyping or ribosomal RNA sequencing, this is how you can show groups are related to each other. So like you could show a group like Enterobacteriaceae um, or a group of proteobacterium. And so in a domain, a phylum, or a genus, there's an RNA signature. So it's the same kind of idea where you can separate out um, the DNA and then you hybridize it with these, pro these probes so you make it come together and it has like dye markers, so you can see a pattern emerge, basically. And so that pattern, if it's similar, means that those things might be similar to each other, like they might be in genetically related groups. Okay, one that is um, probably most prevalent is doing different kinds of what's called PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. Um, this is good for um, rapid, accurate identification, um, because you have Vestigious organisms, which are the ones that are picky, they're hard to culture. So instead of having to culture them, you can actually just extract the DNA directly from the sample and then test that DNA to see what it is. Also solving crimes, like my sister and I always joke, we watch the old forensic files like from the 90s. And I was like, man, there's like, we, our joke is, our running joke is that there's sperm and blood everywhere. Like, because like, Criminals are stupid, so they just leave like evidence all over the place, and you can isolate that DNA and amplify it, which is what PCR does, so that you can see what's going on. And then Lori Show, Baby Daddy, PCR is probably a huge part of that as far as processing the DNA and sequencing it um, so that you can see if two people are related to each other. So basically, it's kind of weird, but it's like a DNA photocopier. So you literally make copies of the DNA that's in the sample. 
you're amplifying it so that you can visually see it. So even if you have one piece of DNA in that sample, you're going to add these things that are called primers, and they're going to bind to either side of that piece of DNA. And then you're going to add DNA polymerase to the mix, just like the DNA polymerase that you have in your cells, and it's going to go through and copy the bases that are there starting at the primers, and it'll do it in both directions so that you get a double strand of DNA. And then those will open up, and then you copy both of those, and then those open up, and you copy both of those, and you get exponential amounts of DNA made. And so this is accomplished by a machine that's called a thermocycler, and it will go through alternating heating and cooling cycles. And when you heat it, it opens up the DNA. The enzymes that you add copy it, and then when you cool it, it seals it back together. And then you heat it and open it up, and then you cool it and it'll seal it back together. And then you have exponential copies of DNA in your little sample. So this is an example of where you could use this information. So it's basically like a recipe. Like, what would you need to make DNA? You need nucleotides, right? So you need A, T, C, and G. And then you need the enzyme to tell you to actually build the DNA. And they got an enzyme from some aquatic bacterium that lives in thermal vents, and that's why it works at high temperature. So they use the DNA polymerase, and then they use some other buffers, because they're going to need that to help separate the DNA uh, when they do the final step. So in that little tube, you add A, T, C, and G. You add polymerase, and then you add the primers, and that tells you where to start. Because you don't want to copy all of the DNA, you just want to copy the gene that you think means it's that organism. And the gene is going to be a certain size that you're expecting. So then you put that little mixture in the machine, and, it, and apparently when they did this initially, they literally had to move the tubes from a hot bath to a cold bath. But now it's like this awesome machine that just runs through the cycles. And however the protocol is set up, it'll do, usually like I think ours did like 35 cycles for the PCR that we did. And so you can see that it just amplifies the DNA. So it's called polymerase chain reaction. It's a chain reaction where you make more and more DNA. So if you have one copy of DNA after the first cycle, you're going to have two copies. And then each of those is going to become two, and each of those is going to become two. And so you end up with like 68 billion copies of DNA. So now your tube has a big old thing of DNA in it. But you can't see DNA with your naked eye, right? So how do you know it's there? You take that DNA and you run it through this process called electrophoresis, it's going to separate the DNA by size. So it's kind of weird, but it's like a jello, like a, a thin jello mold. And it has these little compartments in it. And you put the DNA in that compartment, and then you hook it up to a machine and run a current through the jello thing, the gel. And then it'll separate those pieces of DNA by size. The heavier ones will stay at the top. The lighter pieces of DNA will go to the bottom. And if your PCR is good and specific, you'll identify one gene that you think is present in the thing that you're looking for. And then you compare it to a control, which is the ladder, and this means base pairs. So that's literally how many A, T, C, and Gs are paired up. And so it's giving you a reference point. So we know that in this case, the gene we're looking for is supposed to be this size. And we can see that it's that size because it's below our 500 ladder, so it means it's less than 500, right? So in this case, this was an HIV patient that had a weird opportunistic infection um, that was called mycoplasma hemophilus. Felis means cat. This is something that normally would affect a cat. But because he has a compromised immune system, he ended up getting it. So they took the sample from him. And the positive control is here. So that's where they use the sample that they knew had this organism. And then the negative control is usually just saline. So notice how there's no result there. And then the, the patient is him, and he has a very thick, bright band. So that means he definitely had that DNA in there because it got amplified. And then you can visualize it by doing this gel electrophoresis. So this is very common, quick way. So like if you ever hear, like let's say you get tested for COVID and they're doing an RNA test. This is probably what they're doing. Like they're probably doing a PCR to amplify the viral RNA so that you can see if it's there. And those tests are very accurate. Okay. But they take longer. So it's, it's going to take a little bit of time. 
Okay, that's chapter 10. So I'm going to stop there. Sorry for the weird pages in there. Hopefully you can move past that. And I'll see you guys in the last.